webinar. We're going to get started here in just about 30 seconds, so I'll be right back on with you. All right, happy Thursday, everyone. Did you know it's National Rebuilding Month? Yep, it really is. And that fits perfectly with our topic today, resilient building. Given the changes in our, planet's, in our planet's climate, weather patterns, and rising sea levels, we really need to craft an effective resilient building strategy. We need to do it quickly in order to keep our homes and buildings safe and protected. So we're gonna be joined by Green Builder Media Editor-in-Chief, Matt Power. He's here to explore important strategies, best practices, and essential products for increasing the resiliency of our built environment. Matt's going to give us some insight into building flaws and their solutions, areas of concern, and resilient products. Now, if you're not familiar with Matt Power like I am, or you haven't read some of his writing, let me introduce you. Matt is Green Building Media's Editor-in-Chief, and he is an award-winning reporter. He's covered virtually every aspect of design and construction. His articles often tackle tough environmental challenges in a way that makes them relevant to both professionals and the end users. He's an expert on both building science and green building, and he has a long history of asking hard questions and adding depth and context as he unfolds complex issues. Now, this webinar would not be possible without our sponsors, and they are the National Fire Protection Association, Huber, Honeywell, and the Structural Insulated Panel Association. You know, I also wanted to tell you about an upcoming event that some of you may be interested in attending. In a little over three weeks, the Next Generation Water Summit will take place in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And if you have an interest in water efficiency, smart growth, or land use planning, or let's say you're a builder or an architect who operates in the western United States, this is the event for you. With over 40 educational sessions, there's ample time to both learn and network right alongside some of the water industry's top experts and influencers. And we've got some fun activities planned too, including a margarita crawl and a treasure hunt. For more information, please visit www.nextgenerationwatersummit.com. Now, during the course of today's presentation, you can submit questions for our guest. Simply use the questions box on the right side of your screen. I'll review those questions and pose them to Matt during the Q&A time set aside after his presentation. And speaking of questions, we'd like to start today's webinar with a poll question. A lot of you have already been voting. That's great. For those who haven't, we'd just like to know the demographic breakdown of our audience. So if you could answer this one question, we'd really appreciate it. We're going to close that poll here in just 15 seconds, and then we'll get started. So I'll be right back. All right. Thank you very much. It appears that 30% of you are just interested in resilient building, and it's pretty evenly split amongst the other choices. So, again, we appreciate your uh, feedback on that. And, Matt, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mike, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. I have to confess this is my first uh, webinar I'm, I'm experienced with, uh, you know, video and other forms, but uh, I'm kind of excited to do a a presentation in this format. I'm going to show you my screen and hope that this works. And Mike, maybe you could just let me know that we're up and running. You're looking good, Matt. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a little little quick background what got me interested in, uh, in building resilience. I've been a reporter for about 25 years in the building industry. And I've covered some of the big natural disasters uh, personally, um, Hurricane Katrina, for example, and uh, the Category 5 La Plata, uh, Maryland tornado. And I went to the sites. And at that time, uh, I, there wasn't a lot of information out there. I mean, FEMA had, had been around, of course, for a long time. But that was when the information gathering about why buildings survive or fail really uh, began to take shape. And since then, there's been a whole bunch of really relevant research. And from that, I think uh, today's presentation uh, will borrow and hopefully give you some good ideas, whether you're thinking about how to strengthen your own home or how to uh, you know, design a multifamily unit in a city. Uh, I'll try to keep the conversation um, 
balanced between the broad and the specific for uh, green professionals so that uh, so there's something relevant for everybody uh, also after the presentation if you have additional questions feel free to email me you see my email on the screen here and I'll do my best and if I can't answer it and I and I definitely don't know everything uh, I will try to hook you up with the right person so let's uh, let's take a look at where we're going here make sure I'm in the right spot okay first of all when we talk about resilience <clears throat> obviously not all uh, natural hazards or threats are are equal uh, I wanted to bring up probably the most important ones uh, flooding extreme winds etc one category I did not include on here which is sometimes included in what's considered resilience are terrorist actions at this point, I think uh, terrorist events, while they're scary and, you know, we talk about them a lot, are probably not the major issue that's going to face us in our lifetimes. Uh, we are, all of us are far more likely to face one or some of these, um, these natural disasters. And uh, whether or not you're a believer in, in climate change, and, and we are, um, I think you can look around and say, yes, uh, there seems to be an uptick in most of these events. Uh, if you're out in the West, of course, uh, wildfires, I think, are, are part of your daily regimen. And oddly enough, even places that wouldn't normally experience certain natural disasters like Virginia have experienced earthquakes uh, possibly related to fracking hacking activities. Uh, power outages um, we'll get to later on, but that's another form of, of you know, um, controllable um, outcome disaster. Uh, this chart also shows you where some of the worst, you know, wind damage happens in the country. And you might assume that all wind damage is from hurricanes if you look at sort of the tan area on the right. But if you look around the country, these blue zones are also high wind areas. And what's not shown on this map are many of the sort of tornado alley um, risks. So you don't necessarily have to live in a specific geographic region to still take some precautions and do some resilient building for specific types of threats. Now, I borrowed this from the National Fire Protection Association. They sort of lay out the goals of creating resilience. Now, this isn't specifically oriented towards housing, but I think they're relevant. Now, prevention in their own um, in their own handouts they say prevention is a tough one because when you've got a natural disaster how do you prevent it they say you can't prevent it i'd actually disagree with that a little bit and here's why uh well actually let's we'll, we'll get to that in a second they this chart will also be relevant in a little while um if you look down here at all the little boxes you can tick you can sort of evaluate how much risk there is and they use this for protection of cultural like museums and that sort of thing but toward the end of this presentation i'm going to suggest a way that you could use it on a house or a multifamily structure that you could create your own resilient threat assessment and evaluate which systems are actually going to be most beneficial and which systems are not and you could literally create a, a little checklist like this using some of the things that you're going to learn in today's presentation. So is prevention possible? This is the scene from the Ninth Ward, uh, Hurricane Katrina. And as you can see, uh, you know, the houses were literally underwater. And, and when I visited there uh, immediately after Katrina, I mean, there were vans on top of houses upside down. Uh, just unbelievable scene of carnage there. How could this have been prevented? Well, in this case, uh, a lot of the mangroves and the natural protective um, areas around New Orleans had been, you know, cut away and, and moved. And there was some research done afterwards that the storm surge, for example, might have been 30 percent, might have been controlled and been 30 percent less had some of these mangroves uh, been kept in place. So, you know, hindsight is always 2020. But even in the case of natural disasters, if we think out ahead, we can sometimes, um, you know, prevent the worst effects on sort of the human built environment. Protection. Uh, 
Uh, this this shows, in, uh, you all recognize this, it's a sprinkler inside of a home. But what about natural disasters, such as wildfires? Um, there's actually a new trend right now of using outdoor sprinkler systems to suppress wildfires. And this was a really interesting uh, report that the University of Minnesota did. And if you look at the little bars there, uh, the sprinklers were very effective uh, particularly in uh, defensible space, but th I think they reduced the number of buildings that were lost by something like 70%. So using some new systems, now what I would say is combine that with some of the new Wi-Fi systems, like there are heat sensors out there. You can tie in a, a Wi-Fi heat sensor with a sprinkler system, put the Wi-Fi sensors on your house perimeter, and even if it's a vacation home, you could have the, the sprinklers automatically triggered when a heat event approaches them. So there are some neat uses that involve, which I'm gonna talk about some other ones, of new technology combined with old technology that can actually assist in resilience. So the big question, which a lot of people have, is, is why some buildings survive and others don't. This house, this is sort of a famous house in uh, North Carolina um, that was literally the only house left standing on this spit of land, and there were hundreds of other houses flattened. And the secret to this house is actually not a secret at all. This house was built to the new building code. Um, this one obviously was not. So. The short answer to why some buildings survive and others do not is the building code. The longer answer is the right products properly installed. And one of the things that I wanted to get to in this presentation is um, you don't necessarily have to do every single thing in the building code. Sometimes if you identify, there's probably fewer than 10 major weaknesses, shall we say, in a building. And if you can identify and and mitigate those, you may be able to, to avoid 90 or 100 percent of the potential damage from a natural uh, storm event. This is uh, this little map is done every year from the uh, Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, and they evaluate um, the uh, residential building code and enforcement systems uh, and basically see how well they work. Now, if you look down at Florida, Florida's doing great, right? Well, they adopted a new building code. Uh, it was quite a ways back and they, I think they're on version six of it now, but that building code is incredibly effective uh, in terms of major storm events. The, uh, if you look at some of the damage from Hurricane Irma uh, that came up the, um, on the Gulf Coast there, uh, the, the houses that were built to the new code were almost unscathed. So, you know, it's, it is a proven and effective building code and it's very specific. And it, it's especially effective in areas within say a mile of the coast. Now this, this little um, system, however, uh, looks at things a little bit differently. So it's co codes are 50% of it, like what is the actual code? Then how well is the code enforced? Like it, are the people who are enforcing the codes trained? And then do uh, contractors, et cetera, actually comply with it? So it's a sort of a, what would they call a high level view of you know, how states are doing in terms of their resilience. Next one. However, I did want to add this caveat, and this is a, from my experience in La Plata, Maryland. Uh, there were some really nice brand new houses um, that were hit by the tornado down there. And literally, this is what it looked like. There were, at best, maybe a chimney system was left standing. I, I was thinking about it afterwards. If you were faced with a tornado like that, probably, and I don't want to, don't quote me on this, but probably your best chance of survival would literally be to get inside the chimney and stay there because literally everything else was lifted off. And there was one site that I visited that was next to a ravine where entire houses were lifted off their foundation and tossed into a ravine. And these are brand new houses. So 
um, you know, in 250 mile per, per hour winds, like there are in a tornado, you're simply not going to build a house that can withstand that kind of force. There was a report done that said in order to withstand those kind of forces, you'd need a 16 inch thick um, reinforced concrete wall. And that's just beyond, you know, the reality of what most homeowners or builders are going to invest in. So what you should do is get around. There's the scene from The Wizard of Oz. There's a reason that storm cellars existed. Uh, they were effective and they still are. Uh, that's option A. Option B is turn tail and run if there's a category five tornado coming your way. So I just wanted to, to throw that in there because I don't want anybody to think that if you build your house right, you can you can wait out the storm. Some storms are not meant to be waited out. And, for, and another thing that's not meant to be waited out are tsunamis. Uh, when you have a you know 30 foot wall of water coming toward your property, uh, there is very little on earth that's going to stop that. So again, that's that's another caveat. Don't assume just because you've built your house right that you are safe. Best practices. All right, this is a um, something called the green building pyramid. I wanted to start here because I created this pyramid uh, a few years ago. And although it's not oriented directly towards resilience, it does help you if you are building a high performance home and high performance homes overlap with resilience. So if you look down at the bottom of this uh, pyramid, this is the most important stuff and often the easiest stuff. So where the house is located, right? Is it in proximity to a danger area? How is it sited? Is it, uh, you know, is it facing the ocean with big glass windows or is it sited on a little bit on, on a cliff that's 50 feet above the, the potential storm surge area? Um, house size may not be as relevant, and, but some of the other uh, categories are relevant as you move up the pyramid. For example, the type of wall system and insulation is relevant. A home that is insulated, for example, with spray foam has a lot of shear strength added to the wall system. So if you've got a, you know, a wood framed house and you've sprayed a dense cell spray foam in between all those cavities, you have added a great deal of strength to that building. Um, and I, you notice on here that I say, think beyond wood. Wood frame structures can, can do well in uh, natural storm events, but there are also some great systems that are a little more foolproof when it comes to labor, such as uh, structural insulating panels, uh, insulating concrete uh, forms, et cetera. So look at all your options because each one's gonna have its pros and cons depending on what type of natural disasters you might face. And I just wanted to say uh, one more thing about the chart, which is a lot of people start on the chart at the top and they think I'm gonna build a green resilient house and I'm gonna put my solar panels on there and I'm gonna be off grid. Well, if you notice, renewables are right at the top of the chart. So they're the thing that goes on last. So if you don't have that strong foundation, if you haven't done the things on the lower part of the pyramid, then you're not ready for the renewable aspect. So, you know, just, just always prioritize. I'm gonna look a little bit more prioritizing too. Uh, pathways to disaster. So each one of these photos shows a different weakness that has been sort of discovered over the past few years with existing homes. And I'm gonna go into them in a little more detail. Uh, first, I wanted to show you this house in the recent hurricanes of the, over this last fall. This is a structural insulated panel home on stilts that was located in Ramrod Key in the Florida Keys. Now, I actually tried to get some photography of it a couple of weeks ago and the photographer couldn't get in there because there was so much debris from all the other buildings that basically uh, the roofs blew off, they fell over. This was the only building that I know of in the region that was completely 100% unscathed um, by the storm. It features, the, the structural insulated panels that it features are made with magnesium oxide, which is a new material, which actually I just discovered at the Builder Show this year. So it's an inert material. One of the things I like about it is that if it does get wet, it doesn't grow mold. So it's a cool product. And if you, if you haven't heard about it, I would look into it and you could even ask about it. This, this particular house was built by 
Innova, I-N-N-O-V-A, Ecosystems. Um, the, the photo was provided to me by SIPA, but uh, structural insulated panels are a good foolproof way to build a really solid structure that's not likely to lose its roof in a storm either. Uh, the stilts also, of course, are key, especially in coastal regions, and that, that's something that I think everybody knows by now, but that's primarily for the storm surge because water can pass in and out, um, you know, between the pilings. And there's actually, there are actually stilt buildings I uh, believe it's Biscayne Bay uh, down in South Florida that are that are 60 or 70 years old and and they're uh, quite a ways offshore now, but they're still standing and they've been through untold numbers of hurricanes. So the still system can be very effective if it's done properly. Oh, and here's uh, where you see in brackets on the right here. These are the Innova magnesium oxide panels. Um, if you want more information on that, well, you could probably just do a quick uh, Google search and find them real quickly. Uh, this, a lot of them at this point, I believe are made in China and I don't know how the tariff situation is gonna affect those. Uh, there was a company called Extreme Board or something to that effect that I, I talked to at the building show and uh, Extreme Green, I believe it was called. And they said they are going to have a factory here soon that's gonna be producing these magnesium oxide uh, boards. Another use for those boards would be in finishing basements. If you're in an area, even if you're not in a storm area, if you have a basement that floods frequently or you know you want to avoid mold prob problems, this might be a great product to put down there. Um, so we're going to get into some trouble areas to avoid. Roof hangover. So in the south, it's great to have a roof overhang, right? Because it keeps the sun off and you know helps keep the house cool. The problem is that you get a lot of extra uplift on an overhang. Um, this particular house had a porch on it. Now, one thing you can do if you have some kind of a sun porch, you really need to invest in extra uh, steel tie downs that go all the way down to the foundation on the post of the porch. Uh, I would say the same is true. If you have an extended overhang, like a two foot overhang, you really want to add some kind of a tie down to the ground all the way to a concrete foundation system. That, that is a key critical area in a, like a category four storm of uplift. And another aspect of the uplift issue. So what happens with up, uplift is the wind blows over the roof and it creates what's called a Bernoulli effect. Um, and the bigger the roof, the more uplift you get. A lot of the houses that they find that are damaged are missing these little straps. And if you're a builder, you know what I'm talking about. They're the little Hurricane Simpson strong type uh, straps. If you look on this illustration, the areas that are circled, uh, that's usually where these metal straps are nailed in. Often when there's a failure, you find that, you know, not all the nails were used or the nails have rusted or the, the, they weren't actually applied properly. When they are apply, applied properly, the whole system is basically uh, ties all the way from the roof into the foundation. So it's one strong system. On this house, this is fairly typical of a lot of the damage that you see with a with an eave overhang. See how the on this gabled end, the eave is about two feet. Uh, that's a fairly significant overhang. Now, when, in a hurricane um, or tornado, the wind likes to get under the corners, <clears throat> so it gets under the corners, and that's where it can really get purchased uh, for uplift. You also notice that the roof itself has blown off this, and it's a little hard to tell from the photo, I'm not sure, but that may be um, like an ice, an adhesive ice and water shield, which is interesting to me because I, I would have thought that ice and water shield, because it's an adhes adhesive material, would stay attached to the OSB. But uh, I think, you know, again, I, I can't be certain from, because the, the photo is not especially clear, but I think it is troubling if this is an adhesive membrane and it has failed this way, um, then we need to look at why uh, why it failed. Did, did this OSB material underneath get wet and then it lost its adhesion? Uh, also in this picture, you see the round gable end vent. Those are a major um, entry point for wind-driven rain and wind and also contribute to uplift. So one of the key things in a hurricane is to cover those gable end vents. Uh, my, my preferred uh, method is actually to go with an unvented attic, and I'll talk about that shortly, but that's somewhat controversial, but uh, this is my, my preference. 
Um, age of roofs make a huge difference. Okay, well, they make a huge difference up to a certain point, we should say. So these are for shingle roofs. If you look at right about eight years old, um, you get a higher percentage of roofs blowing off. Okay, so what's interesting is between eight and 15 years, it doesn't seem to matter that much. So that's not very long uh, for an asphalt roof to go from being a youngster to being an oldster. Right. So at age eight, it is essentially past its prime. Uh, it, it's interesting and that part of one thing that you can do with asphalt roofs is there are special nailing schedules, meaning you have to do certain patterns in the in the asphalt to make sure that it stays down in strong winds. You know, a lot of failures happen because the pattern was not followed properly. Uh, but there is no perfect roof in a hurricane. Clay tile roofs also were a big problem during Hurricane Charlie in Florida. What they discovered though is that the clay tile roofs that blew off a lot were the ones that were not screwed down. There was a practice in that area and in, in much of Florida of simply using like a, a mortar on the base, on the bottom end of the tile and they'd sort of mortar them one on top of the other. They may not even have been screwed down. So if you are a contractor or you're hiring someone to put tie, uh, clay tile on your roof, make sure that it is fastened with screws, not simply, you know, glued down, which was the practice uh, before that. And, and I think it would not be allowed by code, so it would be a code violation anyway. Um, this is another option for a, an underlayment. Uh, th this is, I like this zip system. Uh, you see he's putting on this uh, heavy ceiling tape so this is a structural system and it gives you sort of a backup plan so that uh, whatever roofing you have on, if you have asphalt shingles on, they blow off. Uh, this system should survive, uh, you know, stay on the roof. It also should remain waterproof because it's its own self-contained system. And it's, I, I consider it sort of your backup plan uh, for whatever roofing you use. Here's another major failure area, soffits. Uh, this, this happened both in La Plata when I was there and in, uh, after Hurricane Katrina. I would say most soffits that I looked at blew out. And so when soffits blow out, of course, that contributes to that uplift problem for um, you know, roofs blowing off. It also allows huge amounts of water to get inside the building. Now there's different, it's actually not that hard to make your soffits much more hurricane proof. So this is from Flash Federal Alliance for Safe Homes. They have, this is like the super simple inexpensive method, which is just apply caulking. Even this would have probably saved thousands of homes in Hurricane Katrina. The, uh, at least the ones that were just windblown, not so much the ones that were flooded. Uh, I would say, if you look at the picture on the right, where he's putting the caulking in between, there's some um, best practices that also suggest putting a screw in. Uh, I would say that's probably an essential part of this too. So you're basically adding more fasteners, adding more adhesive so that those soffits, a lot of times the way they're put in now is they're just sort of loose fit. This gives them a much better fighting chance. Uh, here's another entry point, um, ridge vents, a major problem. Uh, you know, the ridge vents tend to not be, be fastened too well, and they can be any type of roof. But once those blow off, think about it, you've got a big slot right down the middle of your roof, uh, which is going to cause major moisture damage, if not, you know, uplift and other problems. There are products, ready-made products, that can replace some of the old ridge vents. Like here's one from Air Vent. It's a specific type of ridge vent designed for hurricanes. So you're going to spend a little bit more. Uh, it, it's it's engineered to um, not to blow off, but there's other ways you can do this as well. I don't know if any of you are boat builders. I, I've built a few small boats. Uh, this is what's called nail clinching. If you put on a ridge vent and clinch the nails from inside the house, that's one of, actually one of the strongest methods for holding anything together. It's the reason that a lot of uh, you know ancient boats uh, like the Viking ships were able to cross you know oceans uh, when there basically there was nothing holding them together except nails. So uh, you know if you're willing to do a little bit of extra labor, you can clinch a ridge vent uh, down and get a lot more life out of it. 
And of course, this is my preferred method, which is an unvented attic. Uh, Joe Stieberak, who if any of you are building people at Building America, has been an advocate for unvented attics for a long time. I think the, the trick is they have to be done right. The, the concern is that somehow it will trap moisture, but if they're built right, my feeling is that they there's no reason that they should trap moisture. And you also don't put your heating and ventilation equipment in the attic. Uh, you know, that's, it, it's usually human error uh, after the fact that causes problems with unvented attic. And if, when I say unvented attic, I mean, you see at the top, there's no ridge vent, like in a normal house, uh, there's a ridge vent all along the top beam where air can flow up a, inside of the roof decking and out the ridge vent. This is completely sealed. Also would not have a um, gable end vent. Here's another issue um, that, that can be easily addressed. Fasteners corrode and they corrode much qu more quickly than you think, especially if you live in a coastal zone. Uh, a, a, a regular mild steel fastener can be corroded within a couple of years, seriously, and the amount of strength loss is significant. So this, the, the big picture is of an anchor bolt that is what holds the, basically holds the building to the footer or, or, and also may hold down the slab. That should spend a little extra money and get stainless fasteners. I mean, nails can still be effective, uh, but you see at the bottom the, uh, the, the, it, you definitely want to go with galvanized and never with mild steel. But for the minimal additional spending, I would go with a stainless, especially in a high risk area or in a marine environment. Why mess around for you know a couple hundred bucks extra? Put in nails that will outlast the wood. In fact, I just pulled a pressure treated deck off of a house in Florida uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, the decking was completely shot. It had been on there for 20 years. It literally crumbled in my hands. It had been put on with stainless steel um, screws. They looked like they had gone in five minutes ago. So it's an amazing technology and it's worth a little extra investment. This is, uh, for example, I think this is, uh, I'm not sure if it's Simpson or who the brand is, but it, this is a stainless steel anchor bolt. So, you know, they're quite a bit more expensive, but uh, it's not as expensive as replacing your house. Defenestration, I always like that, that word, sort of like when someone gets tossed through a window, you, they defenestrated the window. Well, this is, of course, one of the major places where homes are destroyed. It's not, it's not as dramatic as a roof blowing off. And in fact, when you go up to the house after the storm, you might think, wow, it, we made it, it's fine. And then there's, you notice there's a hole in one of the windows and you go inside and the entire house is soaked. And that moisture is the destroyer of things. So how do we avoid defenestration? And there, I'm going to give you a good, better, best um, option list. Okay, temporary cover just means you know before the storm you're going to throw a piece of plywood up. That's 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 your sort of low hanging fruit to try to keep the rain out. It, you know, will it work? Yes, if it's if everything's fastened properly. It's a big pain in the neck. It's it's material you have to then keep around. Um, it's not very environmentally friendly. Uh, because you end up storing stuff that ends up, you know, getting outside and is rotting in the rain or whatever. Um, window film, I actually like window film. There are some products, for example, um, by 3M that have, from what I've seen, are pretty amazing. Thing. Storm windows don't aren't normally in this list. So storm windows you might think of as sort of the glass overlay windows that you put uh, you know, you, you add it on just to keep the cold out, but you can order storm windows with plexiglass and even Le uh, Lexan plastic, which, you know, Lexan is a, is a bulletproof material at certain thicknesses. So it can be a relatively affordable option. Um, impact glass is the one that everybody may know about that's, that's mandated in, on, on some codes and then smart shutter. So let's look a little closer at these. This 3M film that I mentioned, this is from a video where the guy smashes it with a baseball bat a few times. It's it's pretty good stuff. It's not as inexpensive as as you might think. When you have it professionally installed, I think it ends up being like a hundred bucks a window. I you could install some some of the brands yourself. I guess it's up to you how competent you feel, but I think you could do this. 
quite affordably, probably in the even $35 to $50 range per window with your own window film. You might not get the perfect invisible look that you want. So the only sort of downside is if you don't get it on perfect, does it start to uh, you know delaminate in a few years? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's a little bit of a, a wild card. Um, these are those storm windows I was talking about. And this gives you an idea how much they might cost. These are just some different brands. So they range quite a bit. Uh, and, and also the size affects it. And of course, if you put a special plastic or a, a high impact material in them, it's going to change the cost a little bit. Impact glass. The thing about impact glass is, you know, you, you don't have to do any. You put it in and forget about it. Um, my feeling about impact glass, though, is it's more suitable for areas that are not within that one mile, uh, you know, super high risk zone. I'd say any place where you're at a medium risk would make more sense. So in my quote here, in areas within one mile of the mean high water line, that this is from the Florida Building Code. So I would tend to go with with a different system, probably a shutter system or um, a little more rugged. And, he, and here's why. When a projectile hits impact glass, it doesn't mean the glass is not going to shatter. So the glass may crack. You may hit it a few times. <clears throat> Ultimately, though, there could be a hole made in the glass. And once a hole is made, then the water can enter. So even though the impact glass may uh, essentially have not completely shattered, there's no guarantee that there's not going to be water infiltration. Uh, whereas I think with like a shutter system, you have a better chance of that. Uh, here's, so here's a shutter system, and this is a rolling shutter system. One of the things I like about this is it's, again, you can, it's something you can tie in with a Wi-Fi tool. So on the right, you see this is an app. So you can be, say you have a, you know, you're a snowbird uh, and you have a winter home in Tampa. Uh, a storm is approaching. You don't have to fly down to Tampa and pull down or put on all your your storm shutters you just open up your app and you tell it to lower all the, the the storm shutters you could even program it so that it automatically lowers the storm shutters uh okay and we're down to here uh here's another weak spot the garage doors um garage doors and this this one is actually the the captions kind of incorrect this one shows uh, pressure from the inside not suction so they can during a big blow and a garage door is like a, a diaphragm it's both being sucked in and then pushed out uh it's an area where often that it's the way that a house is destroyed it's like the entry point for destroy de destroying the, the structure so there are products out there that are ready made but here's here's sort of the this is the fema guide to how to make a garage door storm proof these the verticals in there are four by fours it's something you could do you could have or four by sixes rather so the posts you know you could have anchor systems sort of attached to the garage door and i don't believe the posts would be in there all the time uh, it's hard to tell from this instruction, although you could probably design it that way. I guess if you put them on a pivot, you could, you, in other words, you could construct your own stormproof door in this manner. Um, if you just feel like that's too much and you don't want to deal with it, there are ready-made stormproof doors. There's like, there's one, I think Clope has a line, and this is the Raynor Hurricane Ready reinforcing system. And there's a whole bunch of components and cross pieces but they're on there all the time and, and you don't have to mess with them. But again, important consideration. Here's another weak point. Sliding glass doors uh, tend to blow out in big storms. Uh, this one, it, you know, the, a fairly easy fix is to make sure that the that there's some special frames you can get for them. A lot of times though, the reason they blow out is that the frames were not installed properly. A lot of contractors will, uh, not put every single screw in the frame. Uh, that is a mistake. That the, they need to be completely, and it'll it'll seem like too many screws if you're installing one. But it'll seem like too many screws until the wind, uh, until the hurricane winds come. Uh, of course, you can put reinforcing uh, structures on them, and I would suggest that's a good idea too. Is to have, for example, almost like a bar, like you'd put on a castle gate that would slide down over them and. Or, or a couple of them, because think about the pressure is on the middle of that 
um, sliding glass door. So it's, and, and you notice they blew out uh, because that's that's often what happens too is there's a depressurization and then a pressurization. So it's a uh, there's a push and pull going on in a hurricane. So you, so you're uh, you're you don't want your pressure uh, resistance to be in just one direction. Okay, and uh, again, you know, you we can't always plan for everything, uh, but when, for example, a flooding situation happens, we need to know immediately, first of all, that the building has been flooded. I put this uh, thermostat, smart thermostat up because a lot of people don't think about how can you tell, for example, say say you have a vacation home or again, you're like a snowbird, which I bring that up because many homes that are being built today are located in in areas that or they're not occupied for much of the year. A Honeywell or any you know smart thermostat is a ready made easy way to find out what's going on. First of all, if you log, you can log in on your app and you find out that you're your system is not working, then you immediately know the power is down. So you don't have to have somebody you know, run over there and check it. But I'd say you could go even further with this, is if, if you wanted to design a resilient system for your house so that were it to be flooded, you could act quickly. And I, I bring that up because it's allowing flooded homes to remain wet is one of the main reasons that you lose them. And my experience with Hurricane Katrina visiting there several times in New Orleans several times was when I went down a week later and walked into the buildings, they had already begun to smell very foul, like, a, you know, like sewers. And when I went down three weeks later, there was no saving them. They, it was a, they were cesspools inside. However, in the buildings that had some kind of air conditioning, totally different story. They, you know, you'd still have some smell, but it, they were, they were salvageable. So if you can get a drying system going in a flooded uh, structure quickly enough, there is a much better chance that it might one day be habitable again. Uh, it's an, actually an article I wrote about smart thermostats. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to tie this in. So smart thermostats being used to, to alert you. Uh, we work with a couple of these companies. This is Tabuchi Electric and uh, Jinko Solar makes panels and uh, Tabuchi uh, makes an inverter and a battery system. I think they do some solar too. Uh, but my uh, suggestion would be if you have a re remote property is to put a system like this in, tie it to a smart thermostat. So essentially when the power goes down and, and you'd want to put everything up high, obviously, for in case of a flooding event, but if the entire grid goes down, you have some way to dehumidify that space and operate your smart thermostat from a distance. Um, there's many different brands of mini splits. Mini splits have a dehumidification uh, function. In fact, most of them have a dry mode where you're not even cooling at the same time. So if you select a mini split system, tie it in with a small battery bank and a solar, um, a solar array, you could actually have a building saver. Uh, and you know, it's not like you would only use it in an emergency. It's something that would be on the building all the time. You could use it, you know, year round and it would be saving you energy. So it's sort of a win-win, but it's also a great resilient backup system uh, for saving a home that, it, that you don't live in full time. Uh, there's, flood, there's a lot of uh, flood resistant materials. Honestly, there's not as many as, as I would like. This chart, which is from uh, our Celestia project, which was a, a year long project about you know, resilience and, and how, how to live in the future. Um, if you look at the chart where it says classes of building materials on the top right, uh, where it says acceptable, the not, things that are listed with a number five are the best um, in terms of their resistance to flood, their ability to be cleaned after a flood, uh, and the things obviously way down on the bottom at number one are the things that are not going to do well at all uh, during a flooding event. Um, as you see, one thing that's not on here is that magnesium oxide stuff, the, the panels that I was talking about. Again, that's a new product, and I, I would definitely add that in as, as a five on here. So I can I can send you this chart if anybody wants this to, to look at later. So here's a, an illustration of 
how you can prepare a space. And it's, you can use this even if you're not in a disaster zone, you just want to use it in a basement area. Uh, it's how to make a space that can be cleaned and or repaired, replaced easily. Uh, you, you know, a couple simple things like just putting outlets up higher, right? Uh, using uh, pressure treated lumber for the, for the uh, framing system. Um, that wallboard could easily again be a, a magnesium oxide or a cementitious uh, wallboard. Uh, the water resistant flooring, that's kind of a, that, part, part of the issue with the flooring is what's underneath it. Now, if you put some kind of a wood uh, strapping system underneath it, you, you may regret that. So essentially that's probably gonna be a tile system on a slab, a foundation slab. And I would suggest you use an epox instead of doing a grout that you need to coat with a silicone uh, grout uh, treatment, use an epoxy grout that is naturally already waterproof. So that, that's just a, a way to avoid future, future trouble. Here's another product, uh, this track system. So this sits at the bottom of your wall and I believe that the, like if whatever you're using drywall or whatever sits on top of this. So all it does is really gets your wall board up off the ground a little bit. This is probably more appropriate for a, you know, a wet basement, um, unless you have very minor flooding. Uh, it's, it's more for the, the very small, uh, small amounts of flooding, not so much a, a flood that comes in and, and soaks your house three feet up the wall. Now, this uh, I, I mentioned I was going to get into a some kind of a housing resilience calculator. So this is something I totally made up. It's very rough, but I, I just wanted to give you an idea, and it's something you could do on your own. So based on some of these um, things that we've talked about in the presentation, you could actually evaluate the risk factor of a building. And then you, I, I think by doing this, for example, if it's uh, structural materials, if it's a structural insulated panel and it's on stilts, it's plus 15, right? Uh, for for wind, against wind resistance, it's plus 25 uh, against flood. If you look at exterior features, if, if it's got storm shutters, it's plus 10 against wind. If, and then I, I added in age factors, right? So uh, asphalt shingles, um, uh, if they were less than 10 years old, get a you know, plus 15. And, and again, I, these are just sort of, I'm just guessing at these numbers at this point, but I think you could sort of make your own chart and, and roughly estimate, okay, which things are gonna be worth doing for me? What are my real risks with my building and uh, where would my money you know, be best spent? Uh, and my uh, final thoughts for the presentation today would be, uh, you know, at the very least, the building code is there for you. Uh, if you build to code uh, in almost every case in the past couple of years, the homes that have been built to the new building codes have done remarkably well uh, in all but the worst storm situations. It's the older homes and perhaps the biggest challenge that we have in the country right now is of course most homes are older and most homes do need retrofitting. So, you know, so I hope that some of the tips and ideas that I've mentioned in here have given you some food for thought about you know, where you might start with some of your retrofitting. And um, I'm happy to, uh, you know, to elucidate on those if anybody you know, has additional questions and I'll do the, the best that I can to to uh, add some further info. And I will now return the discussion to Mike Colignan, and thank you. All right, thank you, Matt, appreciate it much. And uh, for those of you who are attending, please send your questions in via the questions box. We're gonna go ahead and get to those now. Um, so I had a question and it, and it ties into uh, a question that came in from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. So the benefit of technology allows you to do things like close windows on a home that's, you know, in a different time zone uh, right. or certainly a different zip code. Uh, but if the power goes out, what's well, not going to work? Uh, uh, so I have an answer for that. An well, that's for good that. because okay. that was, you finish, your, finish was, your question. Finish your question. Yeah. Now, uh, okay. Yeah. So Nathan was getting to this. Nathan yeah. was saying it, it, it seems like anything that requires a connection to the internet is always a weak link. 
in either redundant yep. or resilient systems. So he was wondering about your thoughts on that. Yes, and I actually agree completely. And, and I actually, because I travel a lot, um, I sort of accidentally solved that problem, which is cellular. Okay, so uh, I use, for example, I use a T-Mobile hotspot and I pay, you know, when I travel, I pay, I think it's 50 bucks for seven gigs worth of data. I have actually passed this on to many friends is rather than pay a, I really dislike systems where you have to pay a monthly cellular fee, like, you know, like fire alarm systems. I don't like ongoing fees. I, I think they're a little bit of a scam. Um, but with these um, these Wi-Fi hotspots, you can kind of pay as you go and when you need it. So you get one of these, uh, and they're they're like literally like I think there's the 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 4G one is $149 on Amazon. So you put that somewhere high up in your building, and you have even the most minimal battery backup system, like I was talking about, like solar and a, a battery. So all it needs is a minimal amount of power to run this thing you now have full Wi-Fi access to your building. So it's sort of a fail safe, uh, you know, if you had a high risk, for example, you build a house out on Ocracoke Island in uh, you know, North Carolina, uh, it would be a great uh, backup solution, you know, when you're not there in the winter, put that thing up high, put a uh, even one panel with one 12 volt battery with an inverter on it and run that thing, um, you know, run your essential systems and uh, you could you could at least keep informed about your house if nothing else. For example, say you didn't have the you know you didn't want to put a whole solar array on there and power a big system. You could go and get like an Arlo camera system. I think it's made by Netgear. They use very little energy. You could plug that in. You could you could have full camera coverage of your um, building with very minimal power usage and a cellular connection. And, you know, unless the house was literally blown down, you'd be able to check in on your house. Gotcha. Yep. Uh, a point brought up by Robert, um, he, he notes that, you know, a properly built earth sheltered home will mm -hmm. typically withstand a tornado. I don't think that was in the listing or the the certainly at the celestia project list that you showed earlier yeah he's um, right so thoughts he's on right that. yeah no he's, he's absolutely right and you know i didn't mention earth shelters i actually like them a lot and there was a guy um the guy who wrote the book on it i, I interviewed a few but he he died uh recently a real nice fella who uh was really the the evangelist for earth sheltered buildings. I, I like earth sheltered and you're right. That that's one of the few options that actually could survive a tornado situation. The only reason I didn't bring them up is, is because there's such a small, um, typically such a small interest uh, in terms of the sort of the mainstream. But yes, if, if you are willing to entertain uh, earth shelter living, I think they're cool and, and, Definitely, they are one of the more resilient forms. Of course, you, you wouldn't want them in a flood zone. Uh, they'd have to be built at a little higher elevation, but in terms of uh, tornado resistance, excellent, um, excellent performance. Right, you have to have the right site for it. You know, it's, it's yeah, not, exactly. it's not right. a type of home you can just build anywhere. Right, right. Uh, same, the same with dome so, homes. Uh, dome homes are great as well. Right. Um, yeah. So we just wanted a clarification on one thing yep. here, Matt. Um, you talked about flood. I don't remember if you used the term storm surge, but I'm assuming that you're yep. encompassing both of those when you're talking about flooding. Yeah, although, although storm surge is the really active part of the flooding, and it's often the one that does the most uh, damage. Um, it, it, it's usually not long lasting, but it's the one that that's the one that can really sweep buildings away. Uh, you know, and even with the mangroves, often a, a storm surge can build up behind the mangroves. And if it gets too large, it will then roar through. So so the mangroves aren't always 100 percent solution either. Uh, if the storm surge is, you know, a small storm surge, they can handle a big one. Um, it can they may possibly make it worse uh, if it's a really big uh, storm surge. Uh, hat tip to both yep. Nathan and John and Robert. They uh, mentioned that Malcolm Wells is the Earth That's who it is. Guy. Yep. Malcolm. Yep. Yep. Real nice guy. I uh, I spoke with him and about his one of his books. I interviewed him and uh, very knowledgeable. Yep. All right. So thank you, gentlemen, for bringing that name yep. up. Um, 
so I had a I had a question from George. Um, yep. Basically, what he was pointing out was that look, you, you've got these various materials that you can use on the outside to try and make your home more resilient, but mm -hmm. if you look inside, you've got things like furnishings or curtains that can you know go up in yeah. flames in a, in a minute two maybe three minutes and all of a sudden you've got an inferno inside the house so how right. do we how do we balance all the things we just talked about on the exterior with some of the vulnerabilities we have on the inside well that that that's actually there is one good answer to that which is uh sprinkler systems uh, sprinkler systems modern sprinkler systems are when they're put in properly are very effective uh, they uh, you know they they knock a fire down very quickly uh, I mean I, I wouldn't build a home a new home without a sprinkler system and in fact if I had a, a house in a high-risk zone I'd be inclined to put a sprinkler system in them they don't add that much cost and there's actually there's a company called Viking that makes recessed sprinklers. So you don't even, they're not even ugly to look at, which I know some people have a problem with. They basically pop out and when they get hot, the little cover pops out and they, they look like just little white discs. Uh, but you're right. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Do you really want to be in the house when a couch catches on fire, even if there's a sprinkler, you know, blowing on it? No, but I, I think that scenario is less likely, uh, you know, First of all, if you're in a house and it's a major storm, you probably shouldn't be there anyway. Uh, so it's more going to be, it's not going to be a life safety issue, I wouldn't think, as much as a remote saving the property issue. And in that case, I think the sprinklers are, are a good solution. Uh, another question from Nathan. Uh, yep. He says, you talked about... Um, Florida a lot. You, you mentioned Florida. Obviously, yeah. they get a lot of uh, hurricanes, flooding, storm surge there. Um, he, his comment was that the legislature there is discouraging solar panels for backup systems. Um, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, honestly, if you talk to the solar people, it, it's been an ongoing battle. I mean, solar, in fact, Florida keeps trying to roll back its building codes, uh, it, which is kind of it's not they're not the only state but you know I used to live in I, I went to the University of Gainesville so I, I know Florida well I lived there for 10 years and it's really unfortunate because they've got a huge solar potential down there uh, but you're right what they've done is they've kind of um, cut the legs out from under some of the solar incentives and um, I think there's a huge amount of people that are interested in solar as well you know my thought on is that panels are cheap enough now that were, were I to live there again, and I may actually re retire down there, um, I would just invest it with, with or without the tax credits. The, the PV panels are inexpensive enough that the payoff is actually fairly reasonable. Um, it's probably 12 years, maybe at, at the point, at that point, you'd be essentially getting free electricity. So yes, the, the, don't, don't count on Rick Scott to, to back you, <laughs> but it's definitely, um, it's definitely, it's the smart thing to do. And especially how much is your property worth to you? I think compared to most property, you know, putting a, you know, 3.2, um, kilowatt uh, a system on is not going to be a big cost. No. Um, Nathan's pointing out that it's not just the upfront cost, it's also the monthly cost that they're penalizing you on. Uh, I mean, when I say cost, what I really mean is that the utility is charging you a uh, like a distribution, are they charging a distribution fee or something? They're trying to do that. I live in Maine. They're trying to do that here too. Uh, yeah, that uh, that actually is is a political battle, and I think it's just beginning. Um, it, it's where they're trying to recoup what they claim are their you know sort of lost um, costs, and there, there's a lot of stuff to disprove that whole theory. Uh, but yeah, I, I hear you on the the political. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have an easy answer for you. It's going on in other states as well, and it, it's a fight that it, I think is just beginning. We have it going on in Maine as well, and um, it, it hasn't played out yet. But my feeling, too, is that solar is a, a, a tsunami of the good kind that is coming, and it is unstoppable. And it's just getting it's, – it's already at the point where it's on parity with most other fuel systems, and it's just going to be a, an economic um, – 
an obvious economic choice. It's not going to be a boutique uh, selection of power. It's going to be the only choice because, and especially what's driving it in, in large part, for example, in Jacksonville right now, uh, Jinko is going to build a huge plant there. And so you're going to have a, I believe, a manufacturing plant in Jacksonville that if it goes through uh, making you know, tens of thousands of solar panels. And are you telling me they're not going to want to sell them in uh, Gainesville and Tampa and Miami? I mean, that's a lot of uh, transportation costs that they're going to save by, they're, they're going to be fighting that fight with you. I uh, wanted to make sure to put the call out to everybody that uh, even though we're here at the top of the hour, we're going to go the next couple of minutes just to make sure we get the uh, questions covered. And so if you've got any final questions, make sure to send them in now. Um, I wanted to go back to something you had said during the presentation, Matt. You, you said water is the destroyer of things. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and we see this. We see, you know, it causes rot and, and other things. Should we look to metal framing or concrete systems? Yes. Uh, you know, I didn't I didn't bring those up. I, I probably should have included those. But yes, metal framings are, you know, I mean, I guess part of it is, how is the metal treated like is it galvanized in some way i mean what you don't want is rusting metal inside your walls especially after a salt water flood event right um that's that's a difficult issue to deal with uh but i do think there's a place for metal system lightweight metal framing systems as well as concrete i think concrete is usually although it's porous it's pretty easy to clean i mean one key thing with, with concrete would be after a flood event to make sure that it's cleaned fairly quickly because because it is porous it will absorb whatever is going whatever stuff is in the water and whatever smells and odors and if you've ever tried to you know clean a, a basement apartment where a smoker lived for example uh you know that it can very difficult to get odors um out of out of any surface, I mean drywall, any porous surface. So, but yes, I would say definitely those are good systems, uh, definitely worth worth considering and and with natural resilience. And then the the final question that I've got here is <clears throat> it's back to the concrete systems. Do you think concrete wall systems can overcome the concerns they typically face amongst builders about upfront upfront costs? Um. Yes, I mean, I, I think when you say upfront cost, I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of, of concrete wall systems. I mean, you know, concrete CMU blocks are a lot different from monolithic poured uh, concrete walls. But, you know, ICF systems have, have a long and proven history. Uh, you know, part of the concrete wall system is, is, is it reinforced properly? That's in terms of performance and resilience. And also in flood areas, it's, it, does it have the proper um, venting to allow water pass through? Usually this is codified, but as long as that is followed, it, you know, the, part of the issue can be if, if those are filled up with silt, for example, does that mean that the, that the wall is then subject to extreme stresses? Uh, it, you know, there's some maintenance issue there, but there's no reason that a concrete system has to be, you know, prohibitively expensive if it's done right uh, i don't think it's any more expensive than uh, than most other systems all right well seeing no other questions uh, i certainly want to thank matt for joining us today and and going through this presentation on resiliency it's a topic we haven't hit on in some time so it was good to to get back to it um I also want to thank uh, our audience for attending uh, today, asking great questions, uh, reminding us of Malcolm Wells' name. Uh, thank you all uh, for, for contributing and being a part of this. We really do appreciate your interact interaction with us. Uh, I also want to make sure to thank the National Fire Protection Association, Huber, Honeywell, and the Structural Insulated Panel Association for their generous sponsorship of today's webinar. Now, <clears throat> we're going to be back again in less than two weeks to discuss America's renewable energy future. And I'm going to be joined by the former governor of Maryland, the 2016 presidential candidate, and maybe the 2020 presidential candidate, Martin O'Malley. So I hope you can join us. That's going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern time on April 17th. Until then, so long.